You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Benazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody, that rockin' tune means it's time once again for a little show we like to call Around These Parts, the Option Block. A little bit of options analysis, some unusual activity, so, excuse me, so much trading, some act analysis, education, strategy block, the whole nine yards, stir it together. You've got the tasty brew. That is the Option Block. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com. As well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. You guys know where to find it. Head on over to the mothership, theoptionsinsider.com. It's all laid out nicely there for you on the right-hand side of the homepage. Just pick your show, and your audio journey has begun. While you're there on the homepage, of course, check out the breaking news on the options market. You'll see it in the breaking news ticker right there. Usually about 20 or so breaking news stories a day there. Of course, in the main article feed, a whole bunch of stuff. There's education, there's most active, the hot options reports. You guys love that. There's more analysis, there's more UA than we have a chance to get to on the show. All sorts of good stuff, all there on the mothership. Of course, if you just want to mainline the radio, it's always available on your favorite platforms, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, whatever you use, we're there. If we're not, hit us up, let us know, and we'll see if we can get it going there for you. And of course, you can always grab us via the mobile app as well, available for iOS, Android, and the ever-popular Fire OS. And of course, you can always join us as well, live, I always forget to mention it, top of the show, live every Monday and Thursday, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern, via our beloved Mixler, M-I-X-L-R, where you too can stream live, send angry tweets, send angry chat messages to the Rock Lobster and see how the sausage is made for all you hardcores out there. We welcome you in there as well. Now, speaking of the hardcores, these guys aren't them, but I brought them on anyway. I welcome on my cohorts, my partner in crime, my partners in crime, plural. Let's start with, let's go out to the quaint not seaside, but uh, riverside town of St. Charles, where we are joined by good old Uncle Mike Tusa from RCM Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program, sir. Always happy to be here broadcasting live from the Pride of the Fox, St. Charles, Illinois. Yes, the Fox River, the scenic and lovely Fox River with Uncle Mike Tusa and his pickle. Pickle Platoon over there on the river. Maybe if you're cruising the Fox River someday, you too will see him on his Pickle Pontoon boat. And you could say, Uncle Mike, I really love that episode where you talked about X. And then fill in the blanks from there. And now you won't see this guy, unfortunately. He's way on the other side of the country. Maybe that's a good thing, depending on your point of view. Where we are joined by the Rock Lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com. Mr. G, welcome back to the program to you as well. I, it's good to be back here. I decided I want a T-shirt with a pickle pontoon boat on it, with Tucson on the front fishing. There you I go. I think that would be a fine gift. Uncle Mike, can you make me. that happen? We'll see what we can do. Uncle, <laughs> Uncle Mike's pickle pontoon army. All right, with the puns and alliteration done, let's keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block. Like the name implies, this is the portion of the program where we break down what's going on. What was lighting it up over here in the world of options and indeed the broad market as well? Most of the major indices pretty much ending the day 
right about where they started, riding pretty much unched a handle or two in one direction, up or down, but a lot of noise really signifying nothing at the end of the day. Vix Cash taking this opportunity to relax a little bit, heading into the Friday, the big Vol Views day, uh, right around 10 and a quarter to close out the session here today. I'll have to go look up our, our prognostications. I'm not sure if any of us... I think I was leaning a little bit more just given all the uh, all the stuff we were talking about on that show and the fact that there were so many known or known and unknown unknowns lurking out there in the ether that it did seem like perhaps structurally ball should be a little bit higher but the market clearly saying no sir so we'll see we got one more day here uh, for ball to catch a little bit of a bid since we're talking vol let's go back to that dark dark corner the nether reaches of maine where the rock lobster lurks and prognosticates about vol recklessly and wildly. Mr. Rock Lobster, what caught your eye in today's activity, and what are you feeling about this 10 and a quarter or so VIX we got here? I believe I prognosticated nine for tomorrow. You did earlier this week. You said it was going to touch it. So you, we, we are getting perilously close to that level. Let's see. Do we hit it intraday? Let's pull it up and see no, for sure. No, we, we did not. We, we did not. Closing the low pretty much. So there you go. Um. So the question is, is does the market think Le Pen has any chance of being uh, voted into office in France? And as of I was just discussing with my uh, roommates there in the option pit chat room, uh, the market right now is saying no shot at all. <laughs> um, now, we have seen in the past how wrong the market is, but um, uh, when we when they had that the initial election, uh, VIX got to 16. Um, so that's a whole five and a half points <laughs> higher than it is right now. So I think um, the market doesn't care. We had a lot of good earnings. And I I can't believe, you know, I, nine was a little optimistic. I thought we could touch it uh, this week. But um, I would guess probably VIX trades a little higher into the, in, you know, when somebody might have a second thought into uh the weekend but uh vol futures almost everything they're not at the low low lows they have been but golly jeepers they're darn close to the vol products trading the long vol products trading at near all-time lows and the short vol products trading at uh near all-time highs so you know things are at an extreme with vol that's for sure um if Le Pen does not, you know, if the that middle of the road guy gets elected, I'd see a long slow summer for Vol. So this this could this ten and a half could be a high <laughs> for the next three weeks. Who knows? I'm just trying to tweet tweet out your wisdom and share it with the world. Golly Jeepers, is that uh, J and two E's? How I was how do we spell that technical term there, sir? Jeepers. Oh, Jeepers is J E E P E R S. Come on, man. I got you. I'm just giving you a hard time. I'm just sharing your wisdom, your wit, and sometimes wisdom with the world, as perhaps sometimes dry as it may be. We love the technical terms here on this program. We can't get enough of them. Things like Golly Jeepers, the ball is cheap. So interesting stuff. Uncle Mike, you got any of your own pocket witticisms out there beaming in from the hinterlands of all things trading and volatility known as St. Charles, Illinois? Oh, plenty of things, plenty of things. You know, the main, um, the health care bill uh, passed Senate or passed the House today. Uh, so all the politicians in Washington are patting themselves on the back right now. Uh, it passed by, I believe, four votes. I think it was 217 to 213. So, uh, with that, it did pass narrowly, but it did pass. So I think that uh, step one of the uh, the new health care regime, whether it's better or worse, uh, time will tell. Uh, but that is uh, one of the bigger things that happened today on the news. Uh, also, commodities are just getting a drubbing lately. And, uh, you know, I have to be honest, I me being the shiny stuff bull with which I am. I am uh, uh, looking at this as a buying opportunity, but for most of it, I've already bought what I want to buy. Uh, in looking, so I wish I could say I have some type of a role or an update on my SLV collar. Uh, however, uh, the problem is, is I, I actually spent probably 45 minutes looking for some way with which I could do a roll down or a roll out or some type of an adjustment on my SLV collar, but uh, I just wasn't able to pull it off today. 
And uh, in, in terms of finding something that made sense, this is what I'm just kind of sitting on for the longer term. And I need to see like another dollar to either way to do something. And uh, we're pretty much right back where we started with silver. Uh, we've been here before. Uh, could rally again, but uh, uh, I wish I had something to report in the doing stuff land, but I don't right now. So I'm going to continue to watch. And then uh, hopefully over the course of the next two years, I can make lots of adjustments to help the to help educate the audience on adjusting but uh there's a time to do stuff and a time to not do stuff and this is one time that i'm not doing stuff unfortunately I, for the purpose of strategy blocks however i will have some things to discuss today in the strategy block in the world of the s p and i'm excited about today in doing so you just picked that silver collar because you know you wouldn't have to do anything with it that, that's why you picked it we, we know your real motive sir here on the program you know, I have to say that in terms of with all the adjustments I've made through the years on collars, this one that I set up with silver, I would not have guessed uh, that this would be one that I would have not made any adjustments on for four months. Yeah, this was set up with great fanfare, and then we have heard nothing about it. <laughs> not that it hasn't performed well. It's just been uh, an interesting one, uh, just shall we say. You know, silver is getting out there. I'm starting to get inquiries about silver from realms outside the usual markets which you know perhaps maybe then the metals story and the commodity story is resonating. If you're into all that kind of stuff, listeners, the metals, the futures options, the commodities, join us tomorrow for TWIFO Live, 1.30 p.m. Central this week in futures options, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Of course, you can always get it uh, wherever you find your favorite options, Insider Podcast as well. It comes out there as well. And you can listen to us as we sink our teeth. I'm guessing Silver might be on the docket tomorrow. Hint, hint, surprise, surprise. We shall see. Speaking of things that are on the docket for this week, it's been a hot week. Uh, for earnings announcements, uh, not too much popping off after the bell today, though we will get to one silly one, one that I know the Rock Lobster loves and holds near and dear to his heart in a little bit. But first, let's look back a little bit. It has been a rock'em sock'em week for earnings, options, action. Let's start with a little name maybe you've heard of out there once or twice. It's called Tesla. Yes, it's about uh, it's, it's a company that puts out biographies of Nikola Tesla and, of course, the band Tesla as well. So that's all they do. Yet somehow their stock is trading almost 300 bucks. Uh, closing today, $295 and right around 70, 60 odd cents or so uh, over there. But of course, we got to look back a little bit to their earnings, uh, which came out yesterday. And what an interesting one it was. A closing right around 311. This is the stock that's been averaging about 140,000 contracts a day of late. So if you're watching Tesla, it does pretty decent volume, obviously. But yesterday and today, just lighting it up today, hitting almost 400,000 contracts, so well over 2x that, uh, getting close to the three range, hovering right around 395,000 contracts here to close out the day. We saw a closing going into earnings yesterday, 311. They were pricing in about 17 bucks, so somewhere around five, five and a half percent, a little bit between that, probably like more like five and a quarter percent or so over there. And we saw intraday, well, at the end of the day, it, it almost mo- it dropped enough to uh, to merit that down almost 16 bucks, right around five percent to close the day here today, right around 295 and change. Uh, so net premium buyers looking good. Then of course uh, on the intraday move. It also was looking pretty aggressive, down over 20 bucks at one point at its lowest uh, intraday. So that was uh, a pretty aggressive downside move. Kind of interesting because the, the earnings seemed like a bit of a mixed bag. It seemed like like uh, the bulls and the bears both had things to point to and say, look, you know, this, this is how it's going to look for the future. The bulls saying we're going to rally. Clearly the bears taking it here in the actual market action, even though I know a few Tesla bulls out there who were who were excited about these numbers, but still not enough to keep the, the bears from coming in and sinking their teeth in. Of course, it was an active day. Like I said, overall options. Also, we put out a lot of hot options alerts throughout the day. You can, of course, follow us on Twitter, go over to the website, get those intraday at the end of the day as well. And that's surprise, surprise, Tesla was lighting it up today. Not number one, but it was in our top 10, hitting the number 10 with the weekly May 290 puts expiring tomorrow. So this week puts, obviously. Uh, they did some serious number over over 20,000 just on that contract alone let's see that was midday let's see how we ended the day here with total action about 26,000 on that strike so that was a number the 300s are not that far behind it with about 240 excuse me 24,000 so uh, interesting numbers out there in uh, Tesla land you know it was an interesting one we talked a little bit about it earlier this week and how it was setting up 
<laughs> Mr. Rock Lobster, I have to imagine that your hardcores, the crazy of the crazies over there in the pit chat, they had to have been at least interested in Tesla this week. What were they doing? What were they trading? What were they talking about over there in the pit chat about Tesla this week? Um, well, mostly there was, uh, I would say, most of the pit chat was kind of fading a Tesla. You know, I, I don't see after the run it's had how it could live up to the hype. However, it has done so so many times in the past <laughs> that... Um, I was going to say, it's almost because a moot point at this point. I mean, it just seems like it, the rally is inevitable. Everybody's betting on the future. <laughs> so um, I looked at some cheap put spreads in here. I tried to get a fill into the close. I tried to steal one, and I couldn't. Um, so I'm not grumpy. It just uh, – I had a bit in floating this time. That way I wouldn't be grumpy into the show. So, um, But, it, you know, Tesla has a lot of expectations. So I would assume if they're saying – but usually they get away with it. Oh, we're going to spend lots of – we're not making any money, but we're going to spend a lot of money because we're going to produce a lot more cars next year. And Musk has always been able to sell it. So – and since he's probably the best salesman in the world, I assume he'll be able to do it again. But it's a little like Wimpy, you know. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a burger I can eat today. So he just raised a bunch more cash to go, you know, jack production up. And I know this is totally crazy. Totally crazy, but I I think at some point Apple buys Tesla. I'm just going to put the craziest thing out there on the radio so you can tweet that out. <laughs> there you go. That is Apple, crazy. Apple buys so, Tesla. What, what is their market cap now? Do they have the cash on hand to do it? Let's look. <laughs> I think they could buy it with last quarter's profits. <laughs> <laughs> they have what the quarter of a trillion dollars sitting in pure cash. So they could, I, they I could throw so. some around and not even really take a deep dip into the ball. Look at the latest market cap numbers. Yeah, they could probably Tesla. do a takeover on Tenda and Tesla and say, listen, Musk, I'll give you because it's all the stuff that Apple probably would like to invent. But since they don't have Steven jobs anymore, they need, they, you know, they're just going to spend $50 billion for Elon Musk. Because that guy's got ideas. You know, Tim Cook, he might be a good administrator, but that dude's got no ideas. I mean, there's there's no ideas coming out of him. Yeah, they he, haven't had a he's a supply ch He's a supply chain guy who's brought in to make the trains run on time, and he's done an admirable job of that. But you're right. Yeah, he's he's not, never been job, a big picture, they, they uh, stuff. Big and, picture uh, guy. It seems like, uh, speaking of Musk and all that stuff, seems like what really hit them was uh, the drop in customer deposits. Remember, they touted that a lot So back when they launched, or not even launched, announced the Model 3 there. Everyone was putting down, I think it was 1000 bucks, and they had all these people putting down 1000 bucks to translate into all these orders. Well, guess what? In that time, we've seen a, a bit of a drop in those deposits, people taking their money and going elsewhere. I think it was about a 7% uh, drop, so that also indicates, obviously, a 7% in decline in overall orders for uh, that Model 3. I guess apparently it was also some model confusion, which starts to happen when you start putting out Model S and the Model X and you know, the Falcon Wings and then this new Model 3, and apparently people thinking that the Model 3 was going to be an upgrade to the Model S. I'm not sure why they would get that image. It seemed like it was pretty clearly delineated out there, not actually what it is, which is a bit of a step down, but also a much more reasonable one. So uh, interesting stuff there. Kind of the other side of the fence, instead of talking about 7% declines, Let's talk about explosive growth stories. Apparently, the entire internet is using Facebook. I'm the last guy who doesn't really use it a ton. Uh, yeah, they're up to about almost 2 billion, <laughs> 2 billion daily active users, somewhere in that range, uh, which is just uh, during the audience in the first quarter with the 2 billion, 1.93 billion, uh, to be precise. They grew their revenue nearly 50%, which shows just how many ads they're really squeezing into that newsfeed. In fact, uh, Facebook selling off a little bit today. They were pricing in, they closed around 151.80. They were pricing in about five and a half bucks, so nearly 4%. Uh, closing today right around off about only half a percent. So they did sell off a little bit, but nowhere near what they were pricing in. They got as low, though, as about 148. So they did sell off a wee bit. So you had, you had a bit of a chance there, not the full straddle, but pretty close to it uh, in, the, in the intraday before finally uh, settling off. But not, looks like this is one of the ones perhaps falling in the old premium selling category as opposed to Tesla and a few others. And they do say one of the things that caused them to go a little bit on the dark side was that the fact that they're just limited. They can't really, they can't keep squeezing ads into the newsfeed anymore. And you have that drive revenue. It has to come from elsewhere. So they're going to start leaning on, of course, uh, Instagram and uh, some other areas where they can kind of uh, ramp up some ads there and do some more video ads on Instagram. So if you were saying to yourself, gee, my Facebook and Instagram experience, it, it wasn't, it was ad, too much, too ad free. I want it to be a little bit more chock full with ads. And guess what? 
you're going to be a happy camper in the coming weeks and months. Facebook also lighting it up on our top 10 most actives for today with the 152 halves and the 150s all in the weeklies again uh doing about 30,000 and about 28,000 respectively out here so again you like those top tens and those most actives we put them out throughout the day so check out the site follow us on social media we do a lot of those uh we can anything on let's go to uncle mike yeah do you do any do you own any facebook in the strategic night or any of your various and sundry portfolios there and what are your thoughts about uh, its seemingly inexorable rise Oh, I mean, it's up 30% on the year. We do own Facebook and the Strategic Night. That is one of the holdings. Uh, so it's one where you can't argue with this trend. I don't care what your opinion on Facebook is, whether you believe it's going to go up, whether you going believe it's going to go down. Uh, it had the initial crap out after the IPO uh, a few years back in 2012, but pretty much since then, uh, I'm looking at a, a, I'm just looking at an old chart here from September of 2012. Uh, Facebook's around the 17, 18 range, and now it's at $150 a share. Uh, that's one of those ones to where uh, if you uh, bought it back then, you're you're pretty smart. And like I said, Facebook is one where if you have that many users on it, I really see continued upside on it. Uh, maybe not necessarily in the next few days, but uh, over the course of the next few years, uh, until uh, someone comes out and can beat, the, the, there's two billion reasons why, or 1.93 billion reasons as to why uh, it's going up so much, and uh, that's my take on Facebook. Mr. Rock, you get any other grandiose statements you want to make? Is Apple also going to buy Facebook with cash on hand here? I think that that time has passed, although they actually could do it, I think. <laughs> I think they have enough. They might have enough to buy both, actually. I'll have to add up the numbers here, but they're pretty close. If they wanted to, I think they easily could. Um, do do they need to? Apple probably doesn't need to buy Facebook because the, they just figured, well, you're either going to you gotta, you've got to, you've got to interface with Facebook some way. It'll either be a phone or a computer. Hey, and we sell those. Um, and they might be one of the last people selling computers at this rate. Um, so, uh, as far as Facebook goes, I, you know, what's I think, um, because that executive team is so smart, they will find more and clever ways for people to use Facebook for interfacing stuff. Um, I'm not going to be surprised if t they buy a TV network or you know something where they're just become part of everyday life, you know. And then if you have a product that's part of everyday life, it's worth a lot of money, uh, and that's recurring revenues for instead of recurring revenues now on just you know the United States, your global recurring revenue. So um, it's it is a it's a good story. It is not a cheap stock, but if you had to ask me if it'll be higher next year than it is now, I'd probably say yes. And before we roll out the trading block, it is May the 4th, so I do want to give a, uh, a shout-out out to one of our listeners, clearly a talented guy, Steve uh, A. He sent us some great art. So it's probably good for Valve viewers. I'll have to mention it tomorrow, too. But it's uh, a combo of the power of premium selling and the power of the force, and it is Yoda saying, buy not, sell, or sell not. There is no buy. Uh, so there you go. Maybe echoing the words of Don S. There, Mister, uh, Mister, uh, Mister, Mister Rock Lobster. But yeah, some cool art. We tweeted it out. If you want to see it, uh, we'll put it in the show notes as well. Meanwhile, we got to keep on rolling into our next segment. It is time for the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, things got crazy there for a second. I almost had to start the whole show over again. I had to do it all from the top. But you're lucky, listeners. We're just going to keep diving right on into The Odd Block. Yes, the portion of the show where we talk about some of the weirder, the wilder, the more head-scratching paper that caught our eye and came across our tape and went up over there on the mothership, the Options Insider today. Let's kick things off in the realm of all things Texas Tea. That's making some headlines this week as well. It's not all earnings, listeners. And we got uh, Whiting Petroleum Corp, ticker symbol WLL, closing today 
one of our resident cheapies, $7.79, off about half a buck or over 6%. This is the name that does oh around... For some reason, my system is not giving me some average daily volume, so it's probably not that much. <laughs> Doing today about 37,000 contracts, so lighting it up about almost two and a half to one calls over puts, and that, listeners, is where we begin our odyssey in Whiting today. In particular, all the way out to June, the reg looks like the straight up monthlies, no weekly action going on here, and it was the June. Uh, we've got uh, 156 calls here. <laughs> we got a bunch of stuff going on over here. Mr. Rock Lobster, walk us through this whiting while I figure out what we got in here. Okay. Uh, we had the June, I believe it was the O, the 06. Where is that bad boy? There we go. It was the June 8. Uh, huge blocks of calls were sold at 60, what was it? 60, ba, 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 63 cents. Some of it through the bid. Um, I think calls were put up, calls were taken down. Um, all kinds of, it looks like call writing activity. Uh, why do I think that? Because the yield's pretty good. Um, and um, so um, anyway, I just it looks like uh, massive call sellers. And then there's buyers of set puts. So um, that's what we got. There's just uh, right now I think Whiting is down quite a bit. Uh, on near, it's getting kind of near the bottom uh, of its range for the year. So um, anyway, we have a um, we have a um, just a, a big seller of calls, buyers of puts, and it's it, we've had such strange paper in here because all the paper was bullish last week, and this is actually this first bearish like hard bearish paper I've seen um, in this in this group. This is the one that's also relevant here for our question, which we'll get to in a little bit, which we're talking to people about their use cases or perhaps lack thereof for cheapy options. Whiting certainly falling into that cap. Like I said, closing today, $7.80, right around. It's not at the low end of the range, but it's flirting with it. Uh, it got as low back in, what was this, back in August of last year, hit about six and a half bucks. So we're about a buck and, a buck and change north of that right now. So these relatively lofty levels of $7.80. But yeah, we are perhaps threatening to test these lows and certainly someone not afraid to pile in and say, you know what, I'm going to take all the juice I can on that eight strike and perhaps even buy up some sevens. Could be collar in a long position. That certainly is possible. Or it could be someone coming in and saying, you know what, I'm not feeling the love in whiting and uh, I'm, I'm willing to draw some aggressive lines here in the sand on the sevens. And indeed on the eights. All right, let's move on to our next name, our next victim here. This is, uh, we talked about this one before. This is the JP Morgan Illyrian MLP Index ETN. Try saying that five times fast, ticker symbol AMJ. Closing today, $30.60 off about two and a half percent. This is the name. I don't know what's going on with my friends over there live all today and not getting my ADVs. So we're going to skip that part and go right into uh, the average volume, total volume today, actually, which is about 8,300 contracts. Almost 11 to 1 puts over calls. So that should give you some inkling of what we looked at here today. And pretty much of that, of that volume, about 9,000 went up. And looks like one pretty sizable and also pretty tight uh, put one by two here. It was in particular... The uh, May 31 puts, well, was, that's what caught our eye first. It was a big chunk of the May 31 puts going up 6,000 times for prices, about a dime to 15 cents, went up in two blocks over there on the Philly. We also saw some rolling out, looks like about a week or so into the May uh, 31 puts that expire next week. So on the 12th, about 1,500 of those went up. It also is worth noting, uh, Mr. Rock Lobster, because uh, it looks, also looks like about 3,000 of the 31 half puts went up as well as 3,000 of the 31 calls. So 
We got some funky stuff, Guts Strangle going up here. We got uh, maybe a one by two on the put side. Worth noting, 6,000 contracts open on the 31 puts. So clearly probably some closing business going on there. But no OI to speak of really on any of those other strikes that I listed. So uh, some opening shenanigans going on over there. Mr. Rock Lobster, what are you feeling? This is a bit of a weird one, hence the odd block. Uh, there was no bid also in those th 31 puts. Looks like paper bought those, by the way, listeners. And there was no bid in those prior to this, so it kind of just went up for size, uh, which is an interesting one as well. So funky paper all around. What are you making of this slew of contracts going up here in AMJ today? You know, was, I was very – it was overall very confused because the May 31s, those look like – somebody closing the 6,000 open interest, 6,000 print at 10 and 15 cents. Um, they print the 15 before the 10, which usually means that somebody sold. But you know, if you own these puts, why would you close them today for 10 or 15 cents when you're right at the strike? Um, you know what I mean? If you're long them, why would you do that? Um, but uh, it was, maybe they just thought, well, I'm going to get what I can out of them. And I'm going to use that to pay for um, the um, May 12, 31 puts. But none of this went up spread. It all went up on the Philly, and it all went up within four minutes of each other. Okay, so why it doesn't go up spread, I don't know. It was just a flurry of oddness. So, you know, it, maybe I, I just, to me, it looked like it was short covering on the 31s, and then they tried to get a decent price uh for the May 12s, because those are uh, those are pumped up a little bit. Uh, all kinds of strange, actually. Um, and I, I this is actually kind of head scratching. So if it was me, I'm looking at the the Mayo 531 puts to close, and then they are actually trying to sell those May 31 puts down. So they close a short, and then they go sell some more. And then today, AMJ just dropped a bunch. However, the volume dropped by 50% on the next strike. So I don't know if this is a serial roller because the May 31 puts traded to 45 cents, uh, the May 12 41s. So it's just, it, it just strange looking roll paper where they thought, I think they were going to get away with selling these puts. Then today, a quick close and trying to sell some more, even though it was traded on the offer. I mean, there's no bid at 55 cents on a put that's in the money. So, <laughs> nice markets. I'll be no bid at 55 cents for a put that's in the money. <laughs> Not a bad deal. Got to have some bid listed. Clearly, there was a bid. It was just lurking out there in the ether. And it had, it had to come in and snatch up what it could get. Weird stuff uh, all across the board. Speaking of weird stuff, we got one more in store for you listeners. This is U.S. Silica Holding, sticker symbol SLCA, closing today a little bit shy of 35 bucks, 34.84 to be precise, off about two bucks and change or nearly 6% on the day. This is the name that averages about 3,100 contracts a day, doing about 29,000 today. So a little bit more, nearly 10x there, about four to one puts over calls. And that's uh, once again where our eye of Sauron was drawn here. In good old SLCA. Out to June again. People like to play in June these days. And it was the June 30, 37 put spread going up. Looks like paper buying starting the day about 6,500 times. Doing that for $2.70 as the day went on. It was like a total about another another 1,600 or so more piling in. Total a little over 8,000 on the day. Worth noting, there's no OI really of, of any note on either strike. So clearly opening paper out here. Uh, also worth noting, there was about a 4,000 of the 40 calls also went up today as well. So it was a little call action as well. That put spread went up in two blocks over there on the ISE. Again, looks like it was buying. I uh, don't see any stock or anything else that went up with it that would somehow impact the trade. So it could be a friend of ours, perhaps with some stock. In which case, he's, he's going a little juicy. He's going a little in the money, which we don't typically see. Could also be a straight-up spec. Uh, either way, you don't see either of those. Usually having a fairly deep in the money leg like this one is. I mean, obviously, if you want to spec on out-of-the-money movement, of course, 
Uh, you can do things for a lot less. But then our friend clearly wanted some meat on those bones here, <laughs> getting the 37 strike. Uh, looking back at the year that's been over here in good old uh, SLCA, this thing got as low back in May as about 23, a little bit over 23. So it's got some room to run on the downside, which is perhaps what our friend here is looking at when he decided to structure himself a little 30, 37 put spread. It got as high fairly recently, too, back in late February, 61 and a half. So this thing has had quite the range over the past year or so. And not looking, the trend, at least the recent trend, hasn't exactly been in SLCA's favor. And our friend here, if the option paper is to believe, is, is betting that this, this downward trend shall continue. All right, Mr. Rock Lobster, take us home. What are you feeling about this? Fairly sizable put spread here in SLC. Are you feeling, again, the in-the-money leg is kind of of interest? You think this is straight-up spec? You think this is against some stock? What are you feeling? I am thinking that this is another one that was a tough one because I, I don't know if you remember, but there's been several kind of risk reversally things going on in SLCA. Um, they rode the thing all the way up, and it looks like, they're doing the opposite now. Um, in this 3730, it does not appear that this is with stock. However, a few minutes later, somebody rolled out of the May 40 puts in stock. It looked like a close on that volume. So the June the June trade just looked like a straight uh, 3730. It looked like a straight, I'm going to buy a put spread. And uh, more weakness in this whole, you know, anything related to fracking, um, ex exploration, actually pulling the oil out of the ground, all of the service providers, uh, drill rig owners, all stuff like that. All that paper was bullish, and now um, I don't know if that was against like massive short stock positions, but now the paper looks really bearish, or they own a lot of stock and they're just nervous, so they're not going to get you know hosed like they did a year and a half ago or two years ago when oil fell apart. So this spread, though, I mean, uh, it traded. Over the midpoint, if you're trying to buy the spread by quite a bit, so I, I would. It just looks price-wise that somebody's buying this one, um, and so. It, the, but paper overall in here looks it just it looks bearish. More not looking, bear, not looking too bear, good. Our, our friend paid yeah. up to get this spread. I mean, it's a meteor one. He had other options, pun intended, and he went he went meteor. So he wants a little more bang for the buck. That's also. Of note, I think, here. Meanwhile, though, we got to keep on rolling. It's Thursday. Uncle Mike's chomping at the bit. I got to let him off the chain. It's time for the strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the strategy block. All right, Uncle Mike, you've been waiting patiently all week for Thursday to come. I know it's your favorite time of the week, sir. So it's time, sir. The floor is yours. Have at it. Regale us with 20 minutes of adjusting your SLB collar. Go. 20 minutes of it. Holy cow. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I looked at it for far more than 20 minutes, but couldn't find an adjustment to make on it with what I'm trying to do with it. Uh, but I did do uh, Monday. I had a pretty significant day of activity on. I uh, just didn't, I know I've been, we've been talking about the lower volatility environment with which we're in right now. And uh, I got some, I don't know if you want to call them necessarily early Christmas presents, but uh, early uh, long, uh, or I'm sorry, early short option targets were hit much sooner than I had anticipated. So uh, we took advantage of them on a, in a few cases. And I want to go over those trades today, uh, why we did them and uh, some things with which we're doing to, uh, take advantage of what we believe is a lower volatility and in, in terms of the over the course of the next four or five months, which is where the expirations are for these options. First one I want to start with is XLF, the financial ETF. Uh, this is one a position that we entered into uh, longer term holding, uh, entered into it on November 23rd of last year. We got in at $22.36. Now, this isn't the exact price for everybody. This is just kind of the uh, general fill price that a lot of people got. Uh, some people were got in a little bit later. Some people got in a little earlier. But this is the majority of people 
uh, got this fill price. And when I say earlier and later, I'm talking days and weeks, not the fill during the day by any means. That pretty much everyone, or I shouldn't say pretty much, everybody gets the same fill when we do a group trade. So on there, we're bullish on the financial sector. I've talked about that a lot on this show. Uh, the collar that we put on this was we initially bought the 2220 put spread and we sold the 2426 call spread. Concept behind that is that we wanted to have uh, instant protection to the downside, or pretty close to instant. We had 36 cents of uh, leeway until the protection started, and we didn't want to have our upside capped in case for some reason between then and or now, for this matter, in November that S, that uh, XLF were to go above 26. Uh, we didn't want to have the upside capped, but we did still want to sell a little bit of premium. So on there, uh, this overall trade with which we did, we ended up paying 70 cents for the put spread. And we took in a credit of 48 cents for the call spread. Now, the difference between those two, uh, it does come out to being a 22 cent debit. However, the dividend that XLF pays will more than take care of that cost over the course of the year. So with that trade, uh, we come to late April and the markets come up, the markets come down. And this was never intended to be much of an adjusting style trade unless we found something that we felt was really uh, beneficial with what we're trying to do. And uh, we feel that we've come to that point about, well, on Monday, quite honestly. Last week we were looking at it. And I think I was telling you on the show that uh, we were thinking about doing some things, but we weren't quite there yet. Well, Monday we did some stuff. So the first thing we did, the... 20 put with which we sold that was capping our protection to the downside, meaning that we wouldn't have any protection past the 20 level on XLF. Uh, we initially sold that for 81 cents. Uh, that was part of the 70 cent put spread that we bought. But on the short leg of the put spread, we sold the 20 put for 81 cents and we were able to get out of it for 16 cents on Monday. Uh, it's a general rule with which I've had for many, many, many years is that whenever you get to roughly 80% of your profit target or of your of the, what the total credit is on a short option, usually it's a good idea to get out of it because that last 20% is really hard to wring out. It's kind of like when uh, you're trying to wring out a wet towel. Uh, if a towel is really wet, the first part, the first for the first couple of uh, rings, it comes the water comes out pretty easy. But if you keep squeezing and squeezing, that towel is always going to be a little bit wet for the most part. And that's kind of how I view the last 20 cents uh, or the last 20 percent of a short option premium. So we did that. And then the other thing with which we did was we bought the 26 call initially for 30 cents. We sold it for a loss of 12 cents. We sold it for 18 cents. And we actually rolled down to the 25 call, which cost 44 cents. So we actually were becoming a little bit more aggressive to the upside and actually buying some premium to the upside by doing that, meaning that we're only capped at the, from 24 to 25 as opposed to from 24 to 26. And the reason with which we're doing that is that we believe implied volatility is rather low right now. Uh, and over the course of the next few weeks, who knows, uh, that's something that your listeners on Volview can debate a lot more than what we're trying to do with this position. But I just have a hard time believing that we're not going to get some type of higher volatility between now and September, especially in the financials. And if we do get a lot of movement one way or the other, these trades are beneficial. Meaning if the XLF goes down a ton to the 16, 15 level, and I'm just making up numbers here, then we're obviously better off because we have unlimited protection to the downside. And then the same would hold true if it were to go higher significantly. Now, here's the best part, and this is kind of the magic of options in my opinion. What if we're dead wrong and XLF stays the exact same over the course of the next four or five months till, uh, or I should say until September expiration? Well, on that, we paid 16 cents to get the unlimited protection and the actual credit, or I'm sorry, the actual cost of the debit on the trade was 26 cents to roll down that call. So by doing that, we're messing with roughly 2% of the entire trade. Uh, and I really believe that at some point we're going to be able to either sell a short put again or benefit from the roll down of the call at some point. I could be wrong, but if I am wrong, the risk is not very great. And that's one of the ways with which you can benefit when 
trading in a short in a short in what at least what I deem as a lower volatility environment. Some people be, might may believe this is higher volume that we're headed to six in the VIX. I don't, but some people might. So my point is, is that just because I say the the volatility is low doesn't mean it necessarily is. That's my opinion on it. Next thing that we did a similar situation with our hedged SPY on our hedge strategic night. We hedged the SPY and the strategic night with the same options that we use on SPY. Uh, it's kind of one and the same. Similar concept, uh, we got into this SPY hedge back on September 9th of last year, and we were, SPY was at roughly 215 when we did this, and we had the 215, 195 put spread. Uh, we paid $6.44 for that put spread. Uh, the 195 put, we sold for $9. It was fifteen forty four for the long put, $9 for the short put. We got out of that short put at $0.72. Cents. So that one was the biggest, no, a huge no-brainer. We actually probably let that one sit there a little bit too long. Uh, but we did get out of it for $0.72. Cents. Now we have unlimited downside protection for the time being. And then on the call side, we sold the 235, 255 call spread initially. And we actually sold the 255 call for break even. And we bought a 245 call for $3.04. Now, the reason with which we did that was that we looked into rolling up, rolling up the 235 call to the 245 call, but we felt that that was too expensive. And so instead of rolling up like that, we figure that the market's either going to, it's, if it stays the same or goes down, we burned less money, so to speak. But if the market goes up to 255, then we'd have been the same either way. We would have just got the ten dollar profit from two forty five to two fifty five as opposed to two thirty five to two forty five. So if the market goes right to two forty five, it was a bad roll. But if it goes higher than that, which we believe it could, then we feel that was a good trade. So bottom line with all this as to what we're doing, we're just trying to take what we feel what we're trying to do what we feel is taking advantage of a lower volatility environment and closing out some longer-term short options or buying some longer-term premium. So that way, if we do get a big move one way or the other, for that matter, during the summer, uh, we'll be able to take advantage of it. And that's how we're positioning ourselves going into the summer doldrums. And we are indeed. I was looking at some of those charts that are floating around already about the sell in May and go away and how it works, or it perhaps doesn't, or perhaps it does, depending on where you'd set it up and how you structure it. So, yes, we're heading into that season. All right. Speaking of heading into things, let's head into a really quick mail block here to wrap up the week. It's time to take your seat on the All Star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right, everybody, welcome to the mail block. And let's just dive right into it. We like to ask you guys questions sometimes on this segment as well. We asked you to start the week. We gave you a little pop quiz out there in Apple for earnings season. Uh, we gave you all the numbers. It was right around 146 half at the time. The straddle was right around five bucks. Uh, the puts and the calls, both 27 cents, are about equidistant away. We asked you, what would you rather do? Buy the straddle, sell the straddle, buy the call, or buy the puts? I said premium buyers might be happy uh, after a result of these earnings, but not our listeners who are clearly biased in the call side of the space. And judging by the OI and the skew, that may be the case out there in the broad market as well. 44% saying they wanted to buy that call. 34% saying sell the straddle slash uh, iron fly. Ironically, neither of those really working out very well. 18% saying buy the straddle and uh, only 7% turning in what turned out to be the salient option, which is even though 138, I don't think I'll have to go look at I don't think it got uh, down. We'll have to go see. And I don't think it got down to 138. So pretty much uh, <laughs> losers almost across the board. And I don't matter how much you went here in some of these ways, at least the way we structured that particular question. And we asked you today, Mr. Rock Lobster, we were inspired by you. We know uh, we know how much you love the Zingas. You know, you love that name. And yet it's kind of fallen on hard times of late, trading shy of three bucks these days down to two dollars and 84 cents to close the day off another 2% today. But they do have earnings after the bell, and they are averaging about 3,000 contracts a day. So the Rock, not the Rock Lobster, the, uh, the Viceroy isn't here, so we can talk about cheap options and options on cheap stocks. So we asked you guys, 
What do, do you guys trade? Someone's out there trading these things, obviously. Do you guys like to trade options on cheap stocks? We gave you answers of yes, down to 10 bucks, so the stock at 10 bucks, or yes, you're a little bit more aggressive, maybe you like to go down to five bucks, or maybe rarely you'll just touch them, or no, the stock itself is the option, which is, of course, we know how the Viceroy used to come down on it. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster, we'll start with you. What is your what is your saying on cheap options on cheap stocks, and what do you think is winning? Um, I think what's winning is people will trade stocks. Um, now I'm going to say down to five because that's retail friendly, um, and I I can sometimes uh, trade options down there when I bought to buy like tons of gamma when it's you know. Sometimes they just all that stuff gets underpriced and it, and it can be potentially interesting. So sometimes, but not not often. Sometimes. So it sounds like you're actually more in like in the rarely category. Uh, that's what I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, put you in. That I one. mean, I'm gonna put me in the rarely category. You want to be in that rarely. category? Trust me, I'm looking at the numbers. You want to be in that category? Oh, I gave you a hint, to Uncle Mike. Uncle Mike, uh, what what are you feeling, sir? Down to ten, down to five, rarely or no, the stock is an option. I, you know, usually I would say the stock is an option. Uh, Unless there's always some, there's exceptions to every rule. If for some reason uh, there was a stock that just moved, like uh, let's say uh, recently Chesapeake Energy was around the five level, I believe, or I think even lower than that. If for some reason they didn't, but if for some reason they had at the money options for a penny or something like that, then yeah, I'd love to trade those options. But uh, that's not the way it was. So in most cases, I would say the stock is the option at that point. I'm kind of with you, but I kind of have to put myself, I think, in the rarely camp because there are a few scenarios, like I think Mr. Rock Lobster was saying, where I could maybe see myself doing it, even though I, it's been, I have to be hard-pressed to think about a time. Last time I did trade an option on a sub-10, let alone a sub-$5 stock. It's been quite some time. Uh, but I have done it in the past, even though it has been some time. So I put myself in the rarely. It uh, looks like our listeners are kind of toss-up between rarely and no. But right now, no, the stock is an option the way I would normally lean except for rare scenarios, about 46%, almost half of you going that way. Uh, 38% saying rarely, and then a tie between 8% each for yes down to 10 and yes down to 5. That's only a flash poll. It's only going to be up for about a day, so you got you know about 20-some-odd hours left. Just put it up for the show. So you got about a day if you want to weigh in on that one. Let your voice be heard. Meanwhile, speaking of the voices being heard really quickly, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Rock Lobster, your comment on uh, Tesla has not gone unnoticed, obviously, and people are chiming in, including like uh, Ron Turkey, who says your comment Apple would buy Tesla with cash? He just says Tesla would never sell. So I'm not sure if he's a, a true he, believer. He kind of is a true believer. I think he's buying the uh, the Tesla Kool Aid there a little bit and drinking <laughs> it down. He said they will never sell. Sip, there's no price at which Musk would part with Tesla. So there you go. You violated the sensibilities of all the Tesla true believers out there. Meanwhile, we gotta keep on rolling into our final segment. It's time for around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, listeners, it's been an interesting week. A lot of stuff popping off on the earnings front. Of course, on the macro political front, we finally see this healthcare debate coming down to an actual vote. Uh, depending on which side of the aisle you fall on, that may excite you or anger you. Uh, we've got other things cooking out there as well. So a lot happening uh, Mr. Uncle Mike, we'll start with you. What is catching your eye for the rest of this week into the weekend? Well, here's the first thing that caught my eye. There was an FOMC meeting, and we did not say the word Fed on this show the That's whole true. time. You're, to you're totally right. I totally forgot. It slipped my mind completely, which is, I think, a great thing. I think that's a wonderful sign, the fact that we went through a whole show and it's just such a non-issue like that. And uh, it was such a non-issue yesterday, if you look at the market movement of it as well. Um, I, I, I'm giddy that we didn't have to talk about the Fed. But, uh, yeah, we had, we're continuing to go through earnings season. And, of course, uh, we have uh, non-farm coming up this Friday. So exciting times. Yeah, you're right. I, I am very excited by that. Hopefully, maybe we got the Fed in the rearview mirror, at least for a little while. We can take a little bit of a breather. There's enough other macro nonsense to obsess about. You, you don't need the Fed in the mix as well. Mr. Rock Lobster, how are you feeling? What are you watching for the rest of this week into the weekend, sir? Uh, what a waste of $4 trillion or whatever they spent. It's just so dumb. The, the whole Fed thing, the whole twist, and it, it was all stupid. You know, if the economy's not going to grow because the policy stunk, it's not going to grow, whatever. But I'm, I am, yes. I am hugely glad they're out of it. And they're just doing their job of just trying to keep interest rates where they're supposed to be and not let banks do stupid things. Just do that job, all right? 
Anyway, so yes, there's, I'm off my soapbox. However, what am I looking for? You know, maybe a bid for vol. Like I said, vol is so ridiculously low across the term structure. Nobody thinks anything's ever going to happen again. It's almost uh, inverse proportion to the noise that comes out of Washington. I've never heard so much crap come out of Washington and seen vol so low. Um, and so right now, the market, what it normally does is it discounts and gets used to anything. So no matter what kind of noise, uh, my favorite is Trump's like, oh, yeah, what, we can fix this Middle East thing. That was my favorite one today. So at least he's making great headlines. That's something you'll ne we'll never have a dearth of that in any Trump administration is headlines. <laughs> That's some there's one thing he could certainly reliably generate. All right, listeners, that music means we've come to the end of yet another show here during, during Fed Week. Didn't talk about it once, so that's some sort of new record and a very happy record, I'm sure, for many of you out there, including us here on the old program. But one last time, let's go around the horn, see what everyone's cooking up that may interest you in your own options trading. Let's start with you, Uncle Mike. What's cooking in the place they call St. Charles and the firm they call RCM Alt slash MISC slash Futures slash Wealth Advisors? Slash if you are interested in working with a financial advisor. Feel free to give me a call. I would love to work with you or talk with you. Uh, I don't have any minimums, so maybe if you have like 100 bucks a month or something like that, I've always worked that way with people. It's what I believe in. Uh, feel free to contact me. Be more than a chat. 312-212-3531 or shoot me an email at mtosaw at rcmfs.com. Hit the man up with an email he wants to hear from you. He's bored out in St. Charles. His silver collar isn't doing anything. Give him something to do. Give him an adjustment. Give him some puts to roll. Let him stay up at night while you worry and sleep. Hit him up, m2saw at rcmfs.com. To get that ball rolling, and maybe your puts rolling as well. If you want someone to help teach you how to roll your own puts, and maybe other things, so you have to ask him about that. <laughs> Mr. Rock Lobster, what do you guys got cooking up over there? Uh, Iron Condor class on Saturday. Uh, you will learn how to put on, manage, look for opportunities, and all the rest of that. Um, using Iron Condor, and I have to say right now, it's a little tough for them, but we'll give it a whirl. Diving into challenging waters, single-digit VIX, Iron Condor. I like it, sir. You're going with no man has gone before, at least for the recent history. <laughs> <laughs> Deep Tough Waters. Go check them out over there at optionpit.com to learn more. And on behalf of the Rock Lobster and Uncle Mike and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and, of course, for joining us live. We love you guys, too. And we'll see you next week for more of the Option Block. Seating program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.